So welcome everybody to the session on managing floods and droughts together, the technical challenges. I am Valentin Eich, I am with the Global Water Partnership, GWP, and I'm part of both secretariats, the Integrated Drought Management Program and the Associated Program in Flood Management, APFM and IDMP, which are presenting this session today jointly. So thank you all very much for joining this session. And um, in order to have a more familiar atmosphere, I would like to introduce yourself and your organization in the session chat on Pathable now. So we have an idea who is here and um, later for the discussion, we know, uh, uh, yeah, we know who are the participants. So uh, for the clarification, both programs, APFM and IDMP that you can see here on the slide are a joint endeavor of the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the Global Water Partnership, GWP. And uh, we are actually networks of partner organizations, um, of uh, organizations working on drought and flood. Uh, and uh, both organizations have actually um, uh, more than 30 partners each from uh, international organizations, academia, private sector, and national institutions as well. So, yeah, this, this session actually complements a session of our partners, the World Bank and Deltares, which already took place here during the World Water Week on Monday. But it focused rather on the governance and the policy challenges of integrating flood and drought management. And they also developed and published a very interesting approach um, for the integration of flood and drought management from a governance perspective, which is called the EPIC response. And I hope uh, I, I would like to ask my colleague Ramesh to share the link for this report in the chat as well. But um, in this session, we want to have a more technical and pragmatic and hands-on view on integration of flood and drought management. Um, we want to think together with you about the potential of integrating flood and drought management closer. So it will be an interactive session. And during the first part, I have the pleasure to interview two experts about the integration of flood and drought management. And then we will hear two presentations about uh, practical efforts in South Korea and the Volta Basin of integrating flood and drought management. And after this, there will be time for um, questions and comments from you, the audience. And I would like to ask and encourage you already now to comment via the Pathable chat um, with your experiences and so on. Um, either the speakers will try to respond directly in the chat to your questions, or we will pick up the questions later and um, um, discuss them here in the, in the plenary sessions. And this brings me already to, to the next point. We planned this session actually in order to tap into your brains and, and your expertise and experience in this regard. And um, since we are currently preparing a report with our partners, FAO and the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. So um, we are preparing a report on the integration of flood and drought management. And we would really like to use this um, session as an opportunity to, uh, to, to hear from the community about uh, current uh, activities and ideas and, 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 um, and so forth about the integration of flood and cloud management. So as I said, we will have therefore two surveys um, with short questions. And Ramesh, I would like to ask you to please uh, share the question one. Thank you very much. I can already see it here. So um, I will ask the audience now please to copy this, um, this short link, which is also in the Pathable chat, just shared by my uh, colleague, Bob Stefanski, um, into your browser or from your smartphone or your computer. So https polef.com slash GWP. And there you will find um, two questions, which you kindly please answer during the, the next session. So the first question is, what are the benefits of integrating flood and drought management from your perspective? Um, Everything is welcome. And then the second question is more on the little on the challenges and potential downsides of integrating flood and drought management. So um, during the next uh, next section, I will interview our two experts, and I'm looking forward to that. But please, during the session, take your time and answer these two questions. Um, thank you very much. As I said, we will share them later during the session, but also more important, they will really feed into our um, report that we are currently preparing. So now I have the pleasure to introduce my interview partners, Ms. Nilay Dogulu and Professor Marcelo Uriburu Kirno. It would be great if you could join me here in the spotlight. So Ms. Nilay Dogulu is a hydrologist from Turkey. She is a former chair of the Young Hydrologic Society and an editorial board member of the Journal of Flood Risk Management. And as an early career scientist, she also represents the International Association of Hydrological Sciences 
IAHS, and she's the research coordinator for early warning system of the Young Professionals Network, EWS YPN. So thank you very much for joining. Welcome, Nilay. And we also have uh, the honor to have Professor Marcelo Oriburi Kirno with us. He's from the National Commission on Space Activities, CUNE in Argentina, and he's vice chair of the Standing Committee on Hydrological Services and w of WMO. And he, in this role, he also oversees the flood and drought programs. And in addition, he's a chief professor at the University of Buenos Aires. So Marcelo, great that you could make it. It's very early for you. Thanks a lot for joining. So my first question is to you, Nilay. As a scientist, where do you see the largest potential for synergies when integrating flood and drought management? And uh, perhaps you can uh, put your answer into the three pillars approach. You know, the three pillars of drought management would be usually used, the monitoring and early warning, the vulnerability and impact assessment, and the risk mitigation and preparedness pillar. Thank you. Thanks, Valentin. Um, well, let me first start by saying, hydrologically speaking, uh, floods and droughts are processes that are temporally and spatially connected. Adding vulnerable, vulnerability and risk into the picture shouldn't change the situation. However, integrated flood management, IFM, and integrated drought management, IDM, these have been addressed largely in isolation by hydromet agencies and disaster management authorities, maybe except the first pillar, monitoring and early warning on which the greatest focus has been placed on. This might be due to the commonality of the required infrastructure to run as an operational service. But on the other hand, in many countries, projects on preparation of flood and drought management plans are separately conducted, often with little or no links to each other regarding the second vulnerability and impact assessment and the third pillar risk mitigation and preparedness. This happens in my home country too, and it made me wonder why is there no such link? When it comes to integrating IFM and IDM, I believe that the greatest potential lies in the latter, the third pillar, risk mitigation and preparedness. Let's assume floods and droughts are two sicknesses that the earth suffers from. As the doctors of earth, here I refer to both researchers and practitioners, we need to make sure that the two prescriptions we write do not conflict or interfere with each, with each other in any way. And we should do our best to minimize possible side effects and the specific uh, side effects of the specific medication in our prescriptions. That is to say, uh, there should be a central uh, that is to say, we shall jointly design and implement a wider range of collaborative, collaborative strategies with appropriate actionable terms for effective risk and mit risk mitigation and preparedness for uh, floods and droughts. Um, and um, to continue the patient doctor metaphor, it should be preferably one doctor writing the prescription or two doctors, but in active communication. In other words, there should be a central oversight for being able to nurture and maintain well-informed and integrated principles for mitigation and preparedness, with both hydroclimatic extremes in mind. Considering that the timing, duration, and the extent of floods and droughts are getting more, more and more intertwined, it's important that we create this synergy early in the beginning when designing mitigation and preparedness measures in all levels ranging from initiation to implementation. This should be done in a science-informed fashion. This is very crucial. Thanks a lot, Nilay, for this answer. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, I, I really like this image of uh, treating floods and droughts as a, as a patient of the same doctor. I think there is a lot of potential in this if you, if you uh, think really closer to it. And of course, I mean, it needs to be science-based and um, who could uh, tell us more as a scientist like you? So thanks a lot for this first answer. Second answer, uh, second question is to you, Marcelo. So what is the current situation regarding flood and drought in Argentina at the moment? Are you, are you well prepared? Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. It's really a pleasure. 
Uh, well, in, in the interest of time, I will share some, some facts with respect to your question, but uh, without going into much detail, of course. Um, in Argentina, only in 2016 was the national system for integrated risk management created by law under the chief of the cabinet of ministers. The objective was to move from the concept of emergency response to that of integrated disaster risk management. And that's a very positive step in my view. Uh, also a network of about a dozen scientific and technical bodies must meet the information requirements of the, the system and provide technical support for optimizing the use of resources. In the, in the in particular case of floods, the operational responsibility is held by the National Water Institute, which operates a hydrological warning system for the Del Plata. It is in charge of forecasting and early warning service for very large rivers at the Paraná, the Paraguay, and the Uruguay. Um, but the, the responsibility of other aspects of the flood risk management, like the defense infrastructure, territorial planning on the floodplains and the seal protection, is scattered in, in different ministries. Uh, if we go to drought management, well, it is at a less developed stage than, than flood management, which is surprising for a country where agricultural exports are the main source of income. Since recently, there is the, the drought information system for Southern South America, the CISA, the acronym. And CISA is a virtual institution that operates within the framework of a regional climate center, an RCC of WMO. And, well, CISA provides tools and information on droughts and their impacts. It is also in charge of issues in forecast for precipitation and also for the evolution of the SPI with a lead time of 15 days. But uh, after the, the previous summary, let me devote a moment to describe the current situation in Argentina. We are, we are not having a promise in 2021, of course. And I'm not even including the COVID pandemic in this statement. A mega drought is affecting the Andes range in the west of the country, while in the east of the country, the Paraná River acquired the lowest levels in 80 years due to a prolonged drought in the upper basin in Brazil. In the Andes, we are facing a process of long term decrease in precipitation for more than 10 years now. And on top of that, this year, here showed a historically insignificant snowfall, and the impacts are really very large. After having been closed during the most part of the pandemic, ski resorts in the Argentina Chile border are now severely affected by the scarcity of snow, as much as the whole tourist sector, of course. In a country where one third of installed power is hydroelectric, half of the annual hydro energy is generated in plants of, of snow melt rivers in the Andes. So you see the impact here. Uh, but if we move now to the humid region in the east of the country, as I said, the situation is not any better. The extremely low water condition of the Paraná started more than two years ago. Keep in mind that the Paraná River is one of the main commercial waterways in South America. Particularly affected is the Argentine port hub of Rosario. About 80% of our agricultural exports are loaded there. Um, to continue moving, the vessels have to reduce their tonnage by 25%, which, it, which means a high increase in transportation costs. And also bear in mind that Argentina is the, num the world's number three corn supplier and number one exporter of soy meal uh, livestock feed due to fat and hogs and poultry from Europe to Southeast Asia. In addition to that, almost 25% of the installed side of power of my country is provided by the city of Talam on the Paraná River. And its stream flows are being less than half of the river mountain. And considering other water uses, the impacts are multiple, really multiple. Yeah. Think of uh, urban water intakes, the fish fauna, slope instability of the river banks, reduced water quality due to higher concentrations of pollutants and sediments, and so on and so forth. So you probably agree with me that the current situation in Argentina is really pretty critical. Uh, thank you, Valentin.
Thanks a lot, Marcelo, for these insights from Argentina. It's, it's uh, really uh, yeah, very interesting to see how it, how it works on the ground and there is still a lot of work to do. Um, th there was sometimes a little bit of an issue with your connection. Perhaps for the next question, you can shut down your video so we can hear you better. But we heard the most part of it. So, um, Nilay, the next question is for you again. Okay, so, um, sorry about that. No, no worries, we still got your answers. And they were very helpful. Thanks a lot. There is growing um, scientific evidence, Nilay, that the integration of flood and drought management provides great synergies for reducing the risk of both hydro, hydro, <laughs> hydroclimatic extremes. So how would you suggest to better bridge the gap between science on the one side, your side, and the applied flood and drought management to guide the integration of flood and drought management? How we can we get the bridge? Uh, how can we bridge that gap? Thank you. Well. Thanks for asking this question. It's an excellent one. Moving from compound risk and multi-hazard research to the integrated management practice, the challenge remains to stimulate the interaction among those engaged in scientific research and IFM, IDM practitioners. There are probably two critical aspects to science practice policy nexus, in my opinion. First, it is wanting to say science should inform practice and policy, but quite another to actually understand and plan how this can be done. Applied, applied research for better practice is usually conducted at universities and institutes quite extensively and concerning a diverse range of topics on floods and droughts. Uptake of these research findings and also, the proposed methodologies require extra effort or responsibility and willingness on the part of IFM IDM practitioners. For example, national hydromet agencies and international organizations working to improve weather, water, and climate uh, services can do more in offering employment opportunities that specifically aim at bridging the science practice policy gap. Secondly, I think we should keep in mind that this gap isn't just limited to one hazard and one discipline. Even in the case of a single hazard, there is also the multitude of disciplines ranging from natural sciences to engineering and social sciences, as well as um, different contexts that require synthesis and integration. Thus, um, the integrated management of multiple hazards Floods and droughts in this case, uh, but uh, there will be many more uh, um, features. Uh, the, the management of these uh, multi hazards features doubled multidisciplinary prospects. Uh, and I also think that catalyzing the transformation towards enhancing the science practice policy interface for integrated flood and drought management won't be so easy. Adoption of sustainable cooperation, collaboration, and coordination uh, strategies and communication mechanisms should do the magic needed for us to tackle this challenge nicely and easily. Thanks a lot, Nila. Yeah, I think you are you are very right there, and especially yeah, this holds not only for the integration of flood and drought management, but really for each of the of the individual hazards as well. And a lot of countries have still issues with that as well, as we could see in the recent past in several um, places of the world. So my next question is to you, Marcelo. Um, uh, so what are the efforts we heard in your first answer about the difficulties that you approach and that there are really signs that um, things are not well integrated at the moment, but are there efforts ongoing to integrate flood and drought management in Argentina at the moment? Is there something you can, you can tell us about that? Yeah. yeah, thank you again, Valentin. I, I will turn off my video for the better connections. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks again, Valentin. Well, to the best of my knowledge, the answer to your question is no, there are no ongoing efforts in that specific regard in Argentina. As I mentioned before, we do have a national system for integrated risk management. It was created only five years ago. However, Although flood and drought management are now under the same umbrella, clearly that doesn't mean an actual stage of integration has been acquired. 
In several fora in uh, Argentine stakeholders have emphasized the need for adequate legal frameworks for integrated flood and drought administration approaches uh, but within a risk reduction strategy. It has also been underlined the need of shifting from top down engineering approaches for flood or drought management to a more integrated and proactive view. However, if you want my opinion on this, it will still be quite a long time before the integration is achieved. In my, in my country. Uh, an article of our constitution amended in 1994 expresses, expressly states that provinces have original ownership of natural resources to defend their territory. So water management functions are handled by multiple institutions operating at the national, provincial, and basin level with a wide variety of functions and jurisdictions, which poses a big challenge. A, a big challenge. Note that we, we have 24 costs. And, uh, at a technical level, it is my impression that there are still uncertainties among practitioners on the real possibilities of integrating the management of floods and droughts. It, seem, it seems difficult to reconcile the large differences in the temporal scales involved in both phenomena. Spatial scales and aerial coverage can also be very different. Modeling approaches for simulation and forecast are different. And most of all, the affected sectors can be substantially different, and so are the requirements they impose. Uh, perhaps when we consider the vulnerability side of things, then yes, commonalities become much more evident, and I'm not aware of any complaint on that argument. So, uh, as Nilay wisely put it, there's still a challenge to be solved about how science should inform practitioners and how practitioners assimilate research findings in the field of integrated flood and management in order to effectively reduce risks. As I said, we still need to go a long way before achieving the goal of integration in Argentina. And possibly we're not the only country in this condition. However, I'm confident that a great contribution from WMO and CWP is made in this regard to outstanding programs like the ITSM and IDMP. At the standing committee on hydrological services, from WMO, we are working hard in the view to the that integration. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marcelo, for this honest answer. <laughs> um, and I can just say from my home country, Germany, we have the same problem that the, there is this fragmentation for every of our counties, Bundesländer, that there is a different um, responsibility for, for floods and drought management. So this hinders, of course, progress in this regard. So thank you very much, Nila and Marcelo, for taking the time. I hope you can uh, stay on. And I see that there are already some questions and comments in the chat. Perhaps you might want to uh, uh, respond to them or uh, uh, also engage in the discussion there. So thanks a lot for joining us. So now, uh, thank you. Thanks to all of the audience who have answered the first survey question. Thank you very much. This is very, very, very helpful. And we will share the questions later. But uh, um, uh, more important for those who are who just joined, um, these, these, uh, the, this input from the audience in the survey will also help us to prepare a report that we are currently doing with our partners, FAO and, the, and UNCCD, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. So um, this is the, the last uh, question that we would like you to answer. So I would like to ask you, the audience, to copy the, this link that is shown here on the slide, but which is also copied by my colleague Bob in the, in the chat into your browser window or your smartphone or wherever you have, have time and then answer these questions. Please, you don't need to answer all three of them, but perhaps you have um, for one of the three aspects an idea or an experience or anything how flood and drought management could be better integrated. So the first question um, looks on the first pillar of, um, of drought management or of, 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 of risk management, which is monitoring and early warning. Then the second one looks on uh, vulnerability or the impact assessment. And the third pillar looks on drought risk um, flood and drought risk mitigation and preparedness. So please answer at least one of these questions in the survey following, following the link that we just posted. Uh, copy the link into your browser and then answer the question. So, um, and take your time. We, we can also uh, continue to answer these questions while we have now two very, very nice and interesting presentations um, ahead of us. So thank you very much for um, sharing this. 
Now I would like to uh, welcome our uh, first presenter here, which is Ms. Yi Yun Sung from the um, Han River Flood Control Office of the Ministry of Environment of South Korea. Welcome, um, Yi Yun. Thank you very much for joining us and taking the time. Um, I would like to invite you to tell us a little bit more how South Korea is really um, approaching this um, difficulty to integrate flood and drought management. Thanks a lot for joining. The floor is yours. Thank you, Valentin. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'm very happy to have this great opportunity introducing our integrated water resources management. Next slide, please. As you can see, the Republic of Korea doesn't have good condition on an aspect to water resources management. Although the annual precipitation is not a small amount, the quantity per capita is only 16% comparing world average because of the high population density. And most of the rainfall concentrates from June to September, and it flows fast through the steep slope. From these disadvantages, a lot of efforts have been made and integrated water resources management to have become a very important thing for a long time. Next slide. In Korea, several central government agencies are related closely regarding the water issues. Of those, water management is overseen by the Ministry of Environment. The Ministry of Environment has four flood control offices responsible for front line of water management. Next slide. You can see the flood control offices main missions at this slide. It performs tests about overall water management and serves as a regional control tower for water management. Next, please. Let's talk about the flood management. There are structural and non-structural measures against the flood. As a non-structural measure, the flood forecast is issued by designated standard water level in consideration of the embankment. Last year, a total of 109 flood forecasts were issued due to the torrential rainfall. And considering the number of the flood forecast for the past 10 years was totally 121, it can be seen that the importance of flood management is growing by the climate change. Next, please. For flood control, BAM plays an important role. Actually, BAM management is the responsibility of the BAM corporations such as K water in Korea, but oper operations with hydrological effects require the approval from the flood control offices. The flood control offices set the restricted water level for securing control capacity during the flood season. In the case of 2018, flood control office decided to open the BAM gates in concert with K water in advance of the flood. And stored water during the rainfall was used to, to prepare for the next drought season. Next, please. As we all know, the flood and drought seem to be on opposite sides. But if you add the daily flow on there, they are in one cycle finally. Also, we can prepare for the shortage by using it for stable supply and effective adjustment of water use uh, amount by daily streaming flow, flow monitoring. Next, please. For this series of processes, it is essential to have an agreement between the relevant organizations and the reliable data to support their decision making. We are conducting hydrological and basin surveys to produce the basic hydrological data. And the results of the survey provide to public 
to the public through the website and publications. Next, please. As shown in the figure, the missions you have seen so far are applied to the integrated water resources management, which the precipitation is delivered to users through real-time monitoring of an integrated control center, such as flood control offices. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to introduce some projects currently underway to strengthen the, the integrated water management. This is master plan of National Hydrological Survey to produce the reliable and sufficient hydrological data. We are stipulated by the law to make a 10-year plan for hydrological surveys. And through the plan established last year, the local government's hydrological survey points will be managed as a national survey network. So our ministry support, their, uh, support them to improve their hydrological data quality. By improving the quantity and quality of local government data, the number of the national hydrological network can be increased by seven times. Next slide, please. Another thing is about the water use data. We are setting the demand customized real-time water user location and management system to improve the, the efficient use of water resources. We plan to collect the data of flood control office and the data produced by other organizations and to utilize themselves as input data for a decision, support, decision making support system of integrated water supply and demand. The picture in this slide is an example of a schematic diagram of information on available water resources. The system will support main decision making support items, drought response, approval, adjustment of water use, source allocation based on water demand, water distribution based on source conditions, and allocation of available water resources on a catchment basis. Next slide. The time is very short, so it was very difficult to explain in detail. But the topic of our session is the technical challenges, but I want to highlight a few things that should be the basis for the development of today's technology. Flood and drought management can be linked as a series of processes linked with daily flow management. For integrated water resources management, consultation between related organizations is crucial. In this process, it is essential to produce the reliable and sufficient hydrological data. I think you all agree that the importance of the basic data for technical application. And we paying attention to reflect the needs of users on water use data for reasonable agreement among stakeholders. I hope that our implication, implementation examples will help other countries manage water resources. That is all I prepared. Thank you very much. Yijun, thank you so much. This was very insightful. And uh, I mean, this example is very, very good. I mean, South Korea progressed already uh, very much. and. I really like this approach that you put flood and drought management into the integrated water resources management in general, also on a, in an institutional framework. I think this is really the, 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 the way to go forward. And um, yeah, for the report, I think we need to be in, in, in close context so that we can really use this example. Um, before I invite now our next speaker, Dr. Rafa Tu Fofana to the floor, I would like the audience again to uh, contribute to the survey 
with the link that we um, shared. And also, please don't be shy and uh, share your questions or comments to the uh, presentation that we just heard, but also to the next presentation in the chat. So we can discuss this either in the chat or directly uh, during the Q&A session. So our next speaker, as I already announced, is Dr. Rafatu, uh, Rafatu Fofana. And uh, Rafatu is a hydrologist at the Volta Basin Authority. And she will speak about the current a current project there on integrating flood and drought management in the Volta Basin. So, uh, Ratafu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Valentin. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to share uh, news about our project, the integrated flood and drought management through the technical and uh, regional Volta alarm early warning system in the Volta Basin. Next, please. The content of this presentation is uh, quickly I will show the project area, the project components, the overall outcome of the project, the challenges and limitations in the transboundary flood and drought management, future improvements and opportunities. Next, please. So uh, the Volta Basin lays in West Africa and uh, involve two, uh, six countries that are Burkina Faso, uh, Ghana, the main one in terms of extent. So Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, and uh, Benin. The main objective of the project is to support the six countries to implement coordinated and joint actions to improve their existing flood and drought management strategies and plan at regional, national, and local level. Also to learn from past and current projects related to disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. The project has three components. The first one on risk prevention. We have risk maps, climate scenarios, ecosystem services, and long-term risk management strategy. The third, the third one is on the governance, strengthening re resilience, capacity building of policy makers, and uh, local collaboration. So the component two, that is main technical issues, is on concrete adaptation and stakeholder engagement. We have the early warning system, the pilot pro pilot seats, natural based natural based solutions, and gender mainstreaming issues. Next, please. So quickly, thanks to found, uh, adaptation funds who support us on this project. Next. So uh, one of the one of the main outcome of the project is this Volta alarm that is information for integrated flood and drought early warning system. It has three. Uh, it has four. Uh, four. Components. We have to deal with the knowledge, disaster risk knowledge, then monitor analysis and forecasting hazards and consequences. We have the warning system and communication, preparedness, response capability, and impact assessment. To, to do this, we need to have an integrated IT system to enhance data consideration consolidation, to improve availability and assess, accessibility to risk information on flood and drought, to enhance data sharing, and to provide standardized communication of warning. Next, please. Next. OK. So. The Volta alarm is old 
is held by my delta s. Sorry. Okay. My delta s uh, systematically organized data. It it can allow all agencies to have a, a particular profile to the platform and it products data, products and data. You can see, uh, in, according to the role that the agency plays, so it, that agency can have a, a, a profile as viewer or as data provider. That's it. Next, please. So, uh, Volta Alarm as an integrated flood and drought early warning system can allow us to, to have uh, an integrated flood and drought static, static data that are information on the area drought uh, risk maps, flood risk maps. It also leads to have uh, dynamic observations on flood monitoring and drought monitoring. And we also have dynamic forecasts for flood forecasting and drought forecasting. Next, please. So the objective is to have an integrated, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, we can have uh, to product this, uh, to publish results from this system to have uh, uh, bulletins, regular, regular bulletins on uh, the system to share what, is coming out from uh, this forecasting. So next, please. So this is uh, uh, something that is ongoing uh, with uh, Tima Foundation. We are not at the end of the project. The project is uh, just half a part of it. And uh, we, we think we will have uh, So we have some challenges currently that uh, are lack of data and information observation at national and local level. We also have lack of effective data and information sharing from national to transboundary level and lack of regular maintenance of operations of hydromet and forecasting and warning system. So we need to ensure sufficient number of staff and at national and transboundary agencies. We also have to build capacity, to hold capacity session building to the new technician and forecaster and the all agencies. We also need synergies and complementary with other ongoing projects. Next, please. So the future improvements and opportunities should be investment in development, develop, in development, developing hydro metro observation networks, data sharing from local to national and transboundary level, and uh, operational experiences leading to change changes in the national policies and action plans for disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. I think uh, this is what we prepare and I thank you for your attention. Comment to allow us to uh, improve this presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Rafa, too. That was very insightful. And uh, I appreciate also very much that you that you also um, showed the challenges that you are facing during the implementation of the project. I think this is something where we can all learn, but I think it's a very good approach, especially in this difficult environment where we don't have a lot of data. And um, there is still, as you already mentioned several times, a lack of capacity in, in several institutional frameworks there. So thanks a lot to both of our speakers. So I would like to have also Yun again in the spotlight if possible. And I can see that there are um, already some questions in the chat. Um, the last question of Kevin Webb was, how useful are mobile phones to receive warnings of floods and droughts? So concerning the last mile, how do you really reach the people? Perhaps we can hear from Yi Jun how this is managed in South Korea. Do you use um, mobile phones as well to, to warn the people actually, especially regarding of, of, of fast onset um, uh, hazards like floods? Yes, uh, we uh, we send the text message to their cell phone, and we also have a smartphone application uh, to let the people know the flood situation. So, uh, as you know, the Korea uh, uh, has the use for IT technology, so yeah, everybody can get the information about the fraud by their cell phone. Thanks a lot, Niyun. Uh, Rafa, too, what's the situation in the project? Do you also plan to use, or are you already using mobile phones in the, in the, in the six super river, river countries of the Volta Basin to uh, warn people ahead of floods? Thank you very much. Yes, we have uh, other projects, not this yet, because this is uh, still ongoing. We don't have uh, all the uh, outcomes yet. And uh, the training are ongoing. Still, we, we use mobile phone. We use mobile phone, especially to uh, enhance capacity, capa uh, okay? To facilitate access to news from forecast system, from early warning system to uh, these agriculture groups, okay? These uh, groups, they are in the rural area. Everybody has his uh, cell phone to join families from everywhere so that when we use a mobile phone, it is easy to, to get them uh, involved, to get them involved. And uh, uh, it is not uh, very well developed yet, but we, we use we use them we use them uh, we are now uh, using some pilot uh, actions to to get this done that's what i can say for the, for now Thank you very much, for, uh, Rafa, too. I also think the question is how you use them. And in Germany, we had the case that the, that for the last flood that uh, just appeared a few months ago, weeks ago, um, the, 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 this cell warning was not uh, really activated. So only people that had a spe specific app were warned, which didn't help at all. So I think it's also not just if you do it, but also how you do it. And I can see there is another very interesting question about communities. If, uh, and and, and uh, data. So uh, um, are the data provided directly by communities used as input for monitoring and early warning systems? So this participat participatory approach. Uh, Rafa, too, I think this is also enlightening. If you could sell if in, uh, tell us if in the Volta project, you also use data from the communities, which is then feed and fed into the early warning systems. Yes. <coughs> Yes, communities are trained. Now we have uh, uh, a lot of training to the local uh, actors and they are trained and they, they, they use uh, the cell phone to send uh, data to national, from local to national. And we have some uh, cooperation with local and national to the transboundary. So yes, we, we take data from them because uh, we have a teletransmitted uh, a station, hydrometric station, 
And we also have people on the area who observes the uh, hydro system to, to share data. They are trained to do so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think especially in data scarce region like the World Hub, it's crucial that we use all information that is available and this information of, of the communities is very, very helpful. So thanks a lot for these answers. Um, in, um, in view of the time, um, I uh, would like to close the Q&A session. Please go on in the chat to put your uh, uh, questions and our experts will, will be happy to answer them also during the last 10 minutes. But um, now I would like to, my colleague Mario to share the, the results of the first survey questions with, up, with us, please. So we can see what you answered in regard of the first question. So the first question was, what are benefits of integrating flood and drought management? And now we can see uh, 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 some of the answers that you provided. Efficient of resource, there is a less need for more hard engineering. Technical and multiple aspects of climate change. Of course, this climate change angle is very important. Um, oh yeah, it's so fast that it's hard to read all of them. Perhaps you can uh, uh, go, go back a little bit to, yes, turning surplus waters into dry season reserves, recognizing. So there are already ideas here. You can mitigate the extremes of the two. The same infrastructure can help both problems. Infrastructure, of course, yeah, the communities, they are often in silos. I think it's so important that we really put them together. Yeah, more efficient multiple benefit investments turns a problem into a solution. Yeah, that's a very good approach. Better response and risk disaster mitigations. Yes, yeah, data and information management. This is the first pillar, the monitoring and early warning. And of course, um, there is a lot of synergies that should be used when you're not thinking in silos anymore. So thanks a lot for um, all these answers to the first question. Um, uh, Mario, can you please um, show us the responses to the second questions on the challenges and potential downsides um, of integrating flood and drought management? So there is from IMI an interesting case study that we will surely uh, include in, in, in the report. Thanks a lot. It's about a uh, recent year, there has been good progress on the integration of flood, but there is a still lack of clear knowledge and links with sectors and development process. Yeah, so to, to put this into the overall framework of development. Thanks a lot. Here we are to, for, for this very interesting answers. Yeah, and then of course the impacts are different for sectors and people. So um, yeah, there, I mean, there are still very different hazards. One is a slow, a slow onset or, uh, I mean, there are flash droughts as well, but compared to floods, it's still a uh, slow onset and um, it, it, it affects, it affects um, uh, 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 stakeholders other, in other ways than floods do. Yeah. And economic communication is very important here as well. Yeah. So thank you very much for these answers. Then I would like to uh, ask you, Mario, to um, put up the second survey um, on the experiences, ideas for integrating flood and drought management. And uh, here, these are the answers that uh, the uh, audience provided for monitoring and warning. So due to the fast acceleration of data availability and processing software, it is essential to upgrade practitioners' knowledge periodically on a yearly basis, I would recommend. So not uh, a once in a, in a time uh, uh, capacity building effort, but really to do this continuously, which is difficult under the current uh, framework, how, how this works with project money, which is limited to five years, and then often um, the, the sustainability is a, is a problem. Can you scroll to the next one, please? So challenges, so this is uh, challenges of multi-institutional legislation is of course um, something that needs to be considered. Hydromet stations, flood early warning systems. So there is a lot that we can really look into closer when we um, discuss how we can feed this into our report that we're putting together with FAO and UNCCD. Perhaps Mario, you can show me the responses to the next question, which was on the second pillar. So the vulnerability assessment. Yeah, 
yeah, that often there is a bias towards flooding. That's certainly something we need to take into account. So vulnerability is not seen as a holistically, but really looked into as silos. And the challenges of preparing reliable drought vulnerability information. Yeah, new technologies need to be taken into account. And there is still a lack of, uh, of, 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 of detailed socioeconomic data. So thanks a lot for that. Um, can you also show me, please, Mario, the answers to the last question on risk mitigation and preparedness? A funding funding window for blood drought and flood. Yeah, this is certainly something that needs to come. We heard at the beginning that um, investment is a big issue, and I think this is something that needs to be tackled also by um, these organizations, the, the donor organizations. Requires multiple scale cooperation and promote actionable plans among agencies in developing long term resilience strategies. And it depends on how the DR organization has been set up in a country. This requires the co cooperation with the normal um, uh, structures, preferably this DRR organization has a generic setup. So yeah, I think these are very, very valuable and, and helpful um, um, answers that will, as I said, directly feed into our report. So I thank you very much for providing all these answers to us. We will certainly um, um, have a very close look into them. And I hope a lot of you also provided their contacts for the second question. So we can contact you in case we have further questions. I would like to uh, uh, ask you to collaborate further on this report with us. So thanks a lot. And um, also, again, thank you very much, Nilay. Thank you very much, Marcelo, Rafa, too, and also Yun for um, being available for the session. And I think this was very, very insightful um, already. And I would like to hand over now for the, for the closing remarks to my colleague, Paul Stefanski, who is the head of the technical support unit of the Integrated Drought Management Program. Oui, oui, well, uh, de, de thank you, Valentin, and thank you, everybody. And uh, just want to second Valentin's uh, um, thanking all the um, speakers and participants. So here's the uh, final slide. I'll go through this and then wrap up. We have the two websites, you know, floodmanagement.info and droughtmanagement.info. There is a lot of information there, a lot of tools, um, publications that have been vetted. Uh, and also, if you were interested in becoming a partner um, of either of the drought management program or the associate program at flood management, please contact the emails there. Um, uh, Valentin is in a unique position where he does both. Um, and as you can see, especially from the WMO and GWP side, we are quite, quite integrated on this. Um, so there we have also beginning of, uh, of October, excuse me, we have our annual meetings, which of course will be virtual. So just to wrap up, you know, thanks for, for all the excellent uh, input and questions. Uh, I think the, the main thing that we see these are these synergies between the two communities. Uh, in the past, um, and, and rightly so, we, we developed these products, uh, early warning systems on the flood side and the drought side, um, always keeping in mind that we know it's, at some point um, they would have to be integrated. And these are opposite ends of the integrated water resource management um, thinking. Um, and, but I think you see here in the presentations um, especially from West Africa, you know, a lot of joint projects are starting to focus on both. Uh, I know from the WMO side and, and GWP side, but this is most of our project proposals having both hazards. Um, we mentioned the EPIC report from the World Bank. Um, and I think the one thing just to wrap up that I see the commonality are the synergies and collaborations and the interaction with stakeholders. This is, sounds quite easy, um, but I think for many countries, whether it's developed or developing, this is still quite a challenge um, of getting all the input from stakeholders and then keeping that interaction going. Um, we can have a workshop one year, but then we don't talk again for five years. So I think that'd be the main you know, wrap up here is that we can just search for more of these synergies, make sure we've had questions about the mobile date, mobile phones, making sure that this is in a um, coherent communication strategy uh, that's in various languages um, and that they can go forward and reaching out to stakeholders 
and then even giving the feedback back into the technical side. So I'm gonna leave it there as a wrap up. Um, we were making good progress on looking at both of these hazards and the management focus. So I'll leave it there. Valentin, I don't know if I go back to you, but uh, thanks everyone again for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, for these very wise closing remarks as always. I would like to take this opportunity again to, to thank, um, first of all, our speakers for um, having uh, been available for the session and making it so interesting. So thanks a lot for that. And um, I would also like to thank the audience for, um, first of all, attending this session, but then also providing all these valuable um, information, which is really well kept and well received. We will, um, we will really look into that very closely with all the authors of the report and our partners, FAO and UNCCD. And so I would like to um, thank you all um, in the name of IDMP and APFM and our both organizations, Global Water Partnership and the World Meteorological um, Organization. So thanks a lot and uh, bonne continuation with the World Water Week. Thank you very much. <laughs>